Yeah, welcome back, everyone. So um, this is our second to last session this afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rupam Mah Mahmoud. Uh, Rupam is an assistant professor at University of Alberta. He's also a uh, Canada CIFAR AI chair, and um, he's also the director of the RLAI uh, laboratory at uh, University of Alberta. Uh, before compl uh, after completing his PhD in 2017, uh, Rupam also spent some time working in industry at Kindred AI in Toronto, where he worked on actual robots with reinforcement learning. But what I find very interesting about uh, Rupan's research is that he's really trying to, to push some of the reinforcement learning techniques that we've heard about uh, on Wednesday in Adam's talk and really um, uh, use these techniques at scale on real systems. And what that means is that the kind of RL pursued by Rupan and Rupan's group um, is facing uh, some very particular challenges, uh, uh, namely that of learning um, in a continual manner on, on a robot, learning continuously. If you remember, Adam on Wednesday was talking about the fact that uh, the RL algorithms that he's working with are those that uh, keep on learning all the time. Well, I believe that Rupam is pursuing this vision as well and is really trying to push this as far as he can on real robot. So I'm very excited to see uh, to see this today and hear about uh, some of the progress that have been made here. As usual, you can ask uh, questions in the Q&A, and I believe that Rupam will take the, your questions about halfway through his talk. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre-Lou. Well, uh, about time to start. I'm excited today to share how extremely interested I am to have robots around us help us and live together with us. And for that today, I'm gonna give you a perspective of how we can see reinforcement learning, RL, as a natural consequence of our quest for automation. And in, in addition, I'll also briefly talk about uh, some of the uh, foundational methods of reinforcement learning and the approaches that we can take to bring reinforcement learning applications to real world robots. So talking about automation, let's talk about machines. <clears throat> so conventionally machines used to help us with physically laborious tasks, but nowadays they're also helping us with mentally laborious tasks. Uh, physically laborious tasks, uh, examples would be uh, traveling or lifting heavy items. Mentally laborious task examples would be uh, keeping a steady speed or staying within a lane. Now that's a paradigm shift uh, in the kinds of tasks that are solved by machines. And there is another paradigm shift that's happening now, which is the in the ways tasks are solved by machines. So what is that shift? So traditionally, humans, uh, they have been in charge of all levels of uh, performance uh, improvement, iteration and testing cycles of the machines. The machines did not improve by themselves. Humans tested the machines, figured out how to improve them and updated it in the next iteration. And for that humans, they needed to have a comprehensive understanding of how the task is accomplished. And then they baked it in uh, to the machine. So for that human needs to have the insight of the final desired outcome or behavior. So that's the traditional way of building machines. But in the new way, machines are increasingly in charge of the performance improvement iteration and testing cycles. And for that, we equip the machines with adapting capabilities that lead to automatic improvement. So instead of providing, instead of baking in the final desired outcome, as humans, we tend to now provide the improvement mechanism. And uh, th there is a drawback of that also, which is that instead of having a comprehensive understanding of how uh, the machine is accomplishing the task, 
we rather understand the thing that we provide, which is a mechanism of improvement. Sometimes uh, it is hard for us to understand what is the final outcome. So in short, automatically improving machines, they are emerging. But why is that? Why are they emerging? It's out of necessity. So let's take an example. Um, for an example, we take Kindred's uh, robotic product called SORT. And here we are looking at a clip from 2018. So this machine, this robot is deployed in uh, different uh, warehouses of, of different apparel companies such as Gap and Carters. And uh, each unit, they look like this. And its job is to pick an, a merchandise item from the bin, scan it, and then store it to a particular a designated cubby. So that's the job it does. And you're looking at the video that is not sped up. So it is the real speed. It's quite fast. It was quite fast back then. It's even faster now. And uh, really accurate. So in this machine, do we need automatic improvement? If we, apparently it looks like it's a repetitive task and it might be mundane and we can have all the insights that are needed to bake in the machine and let it perform its task. But then we'll be wrong to think that because it turns out that human workers, uh, they use their uh, common sense knowledge and, and their background uh, knowledge to accomplish this task while facing many different kinds of uh, uh, changes in the environment. Although this looks like a quite a structured environment, However, uh, all uh, kinds of uh, changes may happen over time, such as the kinds of objects to pick, their colors, their weights, they may change over time. So one particular example we can take, where say there is a, a quite heavy item that is above the load capacity of the robot, cannot be picked, but all the other items are underneath that item. So the other smaller items, they can be picked, but they cannot be even seen because they are occluded by the heavy item. A human worker would simply push the heavy item and pick these small ones. So, and that's the kind of uh, uh, a situation that can occur uh, anytime unexpectedly. And it might, the, the engineers who designed this robot might not have perceived this new situation beforehand. In this kind of situation, we want the robot to automatically figure out what is the right thing to do, probably through trial and error. And even if the human engineer perceived this particular situation, there might be many other situations uh, that might be coming unexpected, unexpectedly and when we might not be able to predict beforehand. And, and precisely this is why the traditional way of building machines where we bake in the final desired behavior cannot scale. And especially because if we look at the whole industry, robotics industry, there are many different robots we want to use to solve numerous tasks. And in each case, baking in the solution, that's not scalable. That's why automatically improving machines are necessary. And to draw an analogy, we have to look at the animals because it's a new technology and the, the existing technology, they were mainly based on baking in. So we may wonder what example we have of a machine that can automatically improve its performance. And the example would be us and all the other animals. So animals, they are adaptive and resilient and when they have a wish, they find a way to achieve it. And uh, for example, with the animals, who we are not told by others how to solve each problem we newly face. But we still know through trial and error how to improve our, ourselves. So that's the best analogy we have right now. And apparently, Learning machines, when you build them, they will also operate more like animals. 
Now the question is, how would we build them? And before I proceed, I would like to see if you have any questions. Do we have questions? So I think we don't have uh, questions for now. Uh, okay. But once again, uh, to the participants, uh, you can uh, ask questions to uh, Rupam as usual for, with the Q&A. Okay, perfect. To, to find an approach for building such animal-like machines, you can also look at animals again. Let's think about how we describe animals and inanimate objects. To describe inanimate objects, we usually rely on uh, physical attributes or composition that often suffice to describe a physical object such a, as a, a granite boulder. But for describing an animal behavior, uh, if we just uh, talk about its physical composition and attributes, that are often not enough. Instead, we tend to impute purposefulness or goal in, in, in the system, in the animal, such as a cat here is trying to catch a ladybug. So goal is a compact way of describing animal behaviors. And that's also key to design animal-like machines. So in this new approach, instead of providing the solution directly, <clears throat> we provide a specification of the task or the goal and the mechanism for improving performance with experience by an agent. So in the old way, we used to bake in the desired behavior of an agent. In the new way, we provide the goal in terms of the sensory motor experience of the agent and then provide a learning mechanism that uses experience to arrive at the desired behavior. And we also talked about how uh, the second approach is more scalable than the first. To see it more concretely, let's imagine n different systems that we have to build. We need to build to solve n different tasks, which is illustrated by different shades of blue. So they are different goals, solving different tasks. And the systems that are solving these tasks, they have different bodies as well. Some might be humanoid robots, some might be drones. And as they have different bodies and goals, it is uh, reasonable to believe that the decision-making uh, process would also be, uh, of the generator behavior would also be different for these different systems. And that is illustrated by these uh, different shades of colors for the agent. Now, if we take the conventional approach, then our goal would be to come up with the final desired behavior. We think about what that would look like. We build our insight and encode it directly to the system. And that is difficult. And each time there is a new system, we might need to do that again. And if the solution can be transferred, they can only be transferred to a small class of uh, systems. Instead, in the other approach, we don't necessarily need to provide the, uh, an effective behavior. We, so we start from completely scratch of tabula rasa. Here the goal would be instead to come up with a learning mechanism. And, and if it is uh, generally described, then we can provide the same learning mechanism to each of these systems the same single learning mechanism. And then the agent uses that system in each case and experience to improve its performance over time and then arrive at the final desired behavior. And which was the, the final thing that we want out of the agent. But that's not what we provided. We provided instead the mechanism. And as you can see here, uh, the work is much less might be, in a sense, very hard because it's a, a research question how to come up with learning mechanisms. But if we can come up with the general learning mechanism, then we don't have to actually figure out the particular 
uh, final desired behavior for each different system. So that's how this approach is also more scalable. Okay, now I think I can see there are some questions. Okay, I'm gonna read them. Okay, Sebastian is wanting to do like animals really the solution? Is it a consensus in the field or is some researchers looking elsewhere? Well, it's not uh, necessarily, yeah, it's a good question, right? So it depends on uh, the reasoning and the reasoning looks like what I gave here, which is uh, that if we build animal like machines, it means that we don't have to uh, take care of them all the time and anytime there is a failure, we are not needed to take care of them or, or, or improve uh, its mechanism. Animal has its uh, self-improvement mechanism uh, to take care of any failure. And that is more scalable. So the argument is about scalability. And in that way, it seems appealing. Now, the, the one question might be, is there any other way to achieve a scalable system? That would be a great question. Okay. Shabnam, how do we train an animal-like system, observing the animal? Yeah, so that's something I'm gonna cover briefly, and some of it was also covered. Uh, you see that it's the, uh, as we arrive at uh, machine learning mechanisms. So that's the way to train like animal. Ricardo, is it like doing a digital twin? I'm not quite sure about the uh, uh, reference here. Siddharth, which aspects of the picking algorithm pipeline does the kindred sort uses RL for? Grouping, motion planning, control, binning. It's a great question. In different places, the, the whole uh, iteration of picking, scanning, and stowing, it is uh, divided into sub-problems and uh, there are also, uh, you can see the whole process in a hierarchical way. So RL is applied in, in some of those sub-problems. Okay, Shabnam, again, one system is specific to one animal or in general, we are talking, we are talking about uh, the general way that animal learns rather than one particular animal. Different animals, they, they behave differently, but we can agree that they all look like they can uh, learn from their experience. So we are talking about that underlying mechanism instead of the, the uh, particular behavior they come up with for each different animals. Lan, how do we know when a goal is a goal by itself? And when we need to break goal into sub, sub goals? Right, so in this talk, we'll mainly talk about like providing a goal and we will go through examples of like first describing the task uh, using plain language. So that is one description of the goal, but then converting it into more technical terms using a re reinforcement learning framework. All right, perfect. Let's go back. Okay. So, in order to make machines that are like animals that can improve them, them the animals, we talked about instead of baking in the final desired behavior, we're talking about providing a goal and the learning mechanism. And that can be done within the RL framework. And it's, it's also one of the simplest specifications uh, of an agent. So in this framework, agent, here it's, there's a box for it. It contains the computational decision-making process for this uh, goal-achieving system. And it interacts 
with an environment by taking actions. And this interaction, it also happens on a uh, moment by moment basis or uh, with discrete time step. It can also, uh, so each time step, what is the duration of it? A time step can also uh, be quite long. It can be on a moment by moment basis or it can be uh, something such as like a, a when the train arrives at the destination, a time step uh, can be complete. So that is something determined by the designer. So now we are thinking of uh, having a particular task that we want to solve, how we can formulate that problem using the RL framework. So first, first thing to note is that there is a clear separation between the computational decision-making process and the rest of the world and they interact with each other using discrete time steps. And the duration of that is also determined by uh, the designer. Now, that's something we'll uh, determine uh, what is the definition of uh, each time step. At each time step, the agent will take an action and the environment, it, it maintains uh, some internal state and we assume it to be Markovian in the sense that uh, if we know the current state, it's not, we don't need to know uh, previous states to be able to predict uh, the dynamics of the environment most accurately. And in uh, exchange uh, for receiving an action, the environment changes its internal state. However, however the agent does not get to see the state of the environment. The state of the environment for an agent, it could be the rest of the world, which contains agents uh, just like itself. So for us, it would be like, I'm one person, the world in, uh, involves billions of other persons. And uh, all they are thinking, the, the state of their brain, that con actually uh, will comprise the state of the whole environment. And I cannot perceive all that. So what an agent ends up perceiving is, just an instant, instantaneous snapshot of the state we call observations. So that's what we receive as an agent. And the goal that we were talking about, that is fully specified in uh, RL through a reward signal that the agent receives on uh, each time step. So that defines the interface of an agent and a system designer will design this interface and stick to it. And given this interface, then the goal, the objective of the designer is to come up with the learning mechanisms to put in this box so that the agent can achieve a maximum amount of expected future aggregate reward. So the goal of the agent is to maximize the amount of reward in future in an aggregate it receives. And the, the objective of the, of the system designers or our, our researchers is mainly to come up with learning mechanisms to put here. So let's take an example. Uh, again, uh, the sort robot by Kindred. Uh, it solves this pick and place problem we talked about. So how would we formulate that using RL framework? We will first uh, think about uh, time steps. And also one thing to note is that uh, this task can be uh, divided into a sequence of independent episodes or trials or attempt at storing objects to a, a particular copy. So it can be seen as an episodic task and each episode will contain many different time steps. At, at each time step, the agent will take actions. Now, what will be the action? The actions will be the things that make the robot move, grasp, and drop. So it will be the motor commands that are sent to the gripper as well as uh, to the joints of the arm to make it move. Now, the observation will contain for example, the joint positions and velocities of each of the motors or the joints as well as the gripper. And also 
this system it contains many cameras so the images coming from the camera they will also uh, constitute the observation vector now what will be the reward function now here i want to pause and ask you what do you think should be the reward function the goal is to uh, store an item to a designated copy that can be a good example of a reward function Oh, I think I can see QA. Okay. So there are more questions here. Vargav, animals are driven by curiosity as well. How can we generate the curiosity driven learning rather than reward driven learning? So they are related. Curiosity, you can see that as well as an intrinsic reward. And there are uh, uh, different works that focus on this particular topic, but they can still be do done within the general RL framework. Well, hey, what is the difference between animals and humans from the perspective of RL? Uh, well, we are part of the animal kingdom. As humans, we are also animals. We do different things. Uh, different animals do different things. Uh, from that perspective, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of uh, degree, I would say. Tolga has a question. Uh, okay. Fatima, what is the intersection of deep learning and reinforcement learning? That's a good question. I'll cover a little bit of that. Uh, how can we use both of them together? Brock, don't animals receive some rewards from biochemistry? Yeah, internal to the agent based on their observations rather than strictly from the environment. Does RL have a mechanism for this? Yes. So just because the diagram shows that the reward comes from the environment, that doesn't mean that it cannot be based on the observation. We may as well see the reward function to be a map from the observation, which is also provided by the environment. So there's no conflict there. Sumana, so are you saying that a better representation specification of the task is something that would boost learning significantly keeping everything else in the RL framework the same yes it is important to specify the task better yes if we don't define the action space properly the observation space properly the agent might not have the right set of experience to be able to improve its performance yes told by again Animal intelligence is shaped by evolutionary considerations like survival, breeding, uh, preserving an energy budget. Those considerations shape the earlier rewards, but I think at some point, we build our own rewards hierarchically from these primal rewards. How do we ac account for such dynamics of the evolution? Right, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, it's not clear that we have to do exactly what evolution did to animals. In the end, the, what is the underlying objective here? The underlying objective is, is to come up with a mechanism to improve performance, that, that automatically improves performance. It does not need uh, an authority to, or, or a designer to take care of it. The process that automatically improves the performance Evolution, you can see that as one particular mechanism. No reason to believe that we must go through exact same path. The inspiration we're taking from animals is that, look, we already have a machine that can automatically improve performance. So again, should we let our agents augment redefine rewards in order to improve the sparsity of the reward signal? That would be, uh, something we should consider yes so but how about my question that is what should be the reward function any answer i guess you guys can hear me
Yeah, we can hear you, Vipam. Okay. Right. Exactly. For the sort robot, how can we define the reward function? Yeah, number of correct sorts. But the reward function is determined on a per time step basis. It's a signal that the agent receives every time step. So what would be that value every time step? The agent cannot receive like a no number. It must receive some number, a scalar value. Uh, Rupam, so we have uh, Tolga here, I think, who would like to ask a question out loud. So uh, if uh, Jackie can unmute uh, Tolga. Um, yes, that's good. Thank you, Pierre. Um, I think some of these questions have already been answered. Um, um, so there's that, but um, I guess to answer the question, um, Given the sparsity, I think a and, and primal one would be just the like correct sorting is maybe a reward, uh, but each a, each individual configuration of the robot getting there to a certain sorting point could be some reward too. Um, that being said, um, even if we don't do other things like the way evolution did, don't you think we should at least consider preserving an energy budget in robots. Cause like, if you've seen Boston dynamic robots, there's this dog that's still just like jumping up and down where it's staying, it's not moving. It made me think like, that's not a, what a intelligent animal, like a dog, actual dog would do. Um, when you're idle, you would just sit still because you don't want to burn extra calories. Um, so do you think that should be part of our reward mechanism? The preservation. Right. Great question. So the reward function should capture what the designer has in their mind to be the task. Right. So if the task involves like conserving the energy, which seems like should be the case for most robots, it should be part of the reward. Right. So, but the focus here is for the designer to think about the task from first principles. What they want to achieve, right? So what they want to solve for the task? What should the uh, solution look like? So, uh, yeah, now, now I have some answers. Uh, so for example, if I take a, a Tolga's answer, it, then it would mean a reverse being zero every time step and plus one only when uh, an item is dropped correctly to a cubby. Uh, but then to encourage the robot to achieve it as fast as possible, we might have done some uh, discounting, uh, some discount factor, discounting the reward, uh, with the value of which would be less than one. Now, I, I also like uh, uh, Sanit's uh, suggestion to have negative reward, say minus one, every time step, right? Until the item is correctly sorted. Or say there is a timeout. Try too long, now it's time to give up. Uh, if Maddie, if you are moving towards the correct sort, minimize the distribution uh, between the hand and location of the slot. Yeah, yeah, that can be a sub goal with a penalty. Yeah, and then Christina, how do we design robust reward functions for practical RL applications? What about cases when it is not trivial to mathematically formulate these reward functions? Well, it, in many cases, the tasks, uh, they look like, uh, like you can know as a designer, you would know when the task is solved. You can at least at the very least design the reward function that way, that minus one every time step and the episode ends when the task is solved. So it seems like designing the reward at least in one complete way is not difficult. The difficulty comes from like designing a reward that is also helpful for the agent uh, to learn. So I'm gonna go back to continue with my slides and, and come back to the questions again later. So uh, in RL, much of what we do is uh, we try to find the learning mechanisms for the agent. Now, uh, what mechanisms we are gonna use? We can look at machine learning for that. 
which is a powerful alternative to traditional programming. Uh, here is an example of a traditional uh, algorithm, which takes X as an input and is expected to produce Y uh, as an output. But in traditional programming, we humans write the mapping, encode the mapping by hand. So this is the mapping. And we, in order to do that, we look at some examples of uh, inputs and outputs. So X might be one, two, three, four, and Y might be two, four, six, eight. By looking at those examples, we build the insight. What might be the mapping? Uh, from here, one might reasonably conclude that the mapping is uh, Y equals two X. Then they write the program right here that multiply the input by two and make that the output. But instead, in machine learning, a function relationship can be learned from data. For example, uh, we can parameterize the function with a particular parameter theta, and then come up with a learning mechanism or algorithm that will look at the data itself instead of letting the humans look at the data, and then figure out what should be the desired parameter value for mapping X into the desired output Y correctly. So this is the same data set and uh, the designer will have to specify what uh, parameter class that we are looking at here. It is a linear class, a linear function of the inputs. And then the learning mechanism would work like this. If you look at each uh, input output samples and based on that, it will change its values, for example, it might start with a value of zero, but over time, it will slowly approach to the correct value of two. Now, particularly in this case, uh, the uh, loss function was a squared error between the true output and the output of the uh, function. Now, in machine learning, it's uh, quite common to instead of design, writing the program by hand, we start with the loss function. The goal is specified uh, as a loss function in, in, in many cases in machine learning. And in this particular case, it's a regression problem. So it's, we can take the squared loss and for mechanism, you can use an algorithm such as stochastic gradient descent, which will update its current parameter by computing the gradient of the loss and taking the descent direction modulated by the step size parameter. And in this particular case, uh, the exact gradient looks like this. However, we now have uh, automatic uh, differentiation packages that where we can simply specify the sample loss and the gradient will be calculated automatically. So can we use uh, these techniques for reinforcement learning? So machine learning is a powerful tool for functional approximation. So how would we use those? We actually can if the agent is a function. In that case, we can see the agent to be a, a map from the observation to the action for simplicity. Now we are assuming the observation is same as the environmental state. So we call it a policy, which is uh, represented as a, a, a probability uh, distribution. And then we can determine an objective and come up with a corresponding sample loss and again, go with this stochastic gradient descent algorithm to update the parameter. So that is possible. Can borrow uh, ideas from machine learning, uh, which are also uh, very close to uh, how I, uh, we describe the new machines should be designed, which is by providing the goal in here, in this case, the loss function and providing a learning mechanism. And then if the agent is a function, then we can use functional approximation tools. But the question is whether the agent is indeed a function. So for that, we go back to the diagram again and redraw agent here. It has the same interface as, as this agent. It takes observations and rewards as inputs and spits out actions as outputs. And we have to come up with the computational decision making process to put right here. Now the question is whether this is this can be a function. This should be a function, right? Which is to say that the optimal way of behaving, the optimal actions, are, 
or should they be a map from the observations? So to understand this situation, let's take this as an example of an instantaneous observation. So this is one example of OT. So the agent is a, a, a drive, someone who drives, potentially drives the car and also walk out of the car. And uh, through a mounted camera, this is what is observed. The fence that can be seen through the windshield. Now the question is, just based on this observation, can we determine the optimal action as a map? Is that possible? Now, well, the, the reasonable answer is like it depends, right? So it depends on the state of the environment. So what is the situation right now? The, this instantaneous observation, it confuses two different state, at least two different states of the environment. One is where uh, the driver just entered the car. So the right thing to do is probably to turn on the engine and back up. And the other state is where the driver probably has just parked in. So the right thing to do is to uh, get out of the car. So it depends on the state of the environment world, which is not captured in this particular single snapshot. So in general, practically the agent is not a function. It's rather a stateful process. The function is a stateless process. It is the same output given the same input. That's not gonna be the case for many agents because observation is not itself a, a good representation of the state. So that's a blocker because now it seems like the function approximation tools we cannot really use Fortunately, we can actually divide a stateful process into at least two functions and a memory for the internal state. So uh, there can be two different functions. One is the state representation update function, which uh, based on an internal memory, tries to represent what is the state of the environment right now. And that, Agent state can be fed to another function, and that's a policy function uh, for which now the goal is to uh, map the, the st agent state to the optimal actions. So those are two functions. Then for each of them, we can individually apply function approximation tools. For policy, you can use policy learning, and for state representation update, we can use representation learning mechanisms. So this is a complete um, diagram for a model-free reinforcement learning agent. Now, however, modern deep RL methods, they learn both functions, typically end-to-end -end using neural networks and, and using the same loss function rather than using two different learning mechanisms and loss functions. So here, uh, the observation is mapped through a neural network to produce the action. You know, we can see it uh, as containing two different maps. The observation is mapped first to the agent state and which is then mapped to the policy. But the key here is that this whole neural network is a fit for neural, neural network, which means that it does not have an internal memory. And in many cases, simply doing that using that works because many of the problems that we address right now, especially in simulations, the observation vector is rich enough to represent the state of the environment. And if it does not, then we can simply uh, add observations from, from the past. That is to say we use the history of observations. So that's the situation. And but just by doing that right now, we can, we do have learning mechanisms that can be applied to many different uh, goals and embodiments. Here, there are three different embodiments, simulated creatures, and different goals. This one, the goal is to reach the red dot by the fingertip, and for these two, the goal is to move to the right as fast as possible. But they are now generating behavior based on a randomly initialized neural network, but uh, using the same learning mechanism, it can improve its performance over time and end up 
solving the task effectively. So that's possible. And we have also seen that our agents, they uh, are a promising solution uh, to robotic tasks. Uh, we have seen that before. For example, here now we are looking at a, a Roomba docking to a charging station and its behavior is driven by a default script provided by the manufacturer. And it's behaving slowly and steadily to approach the charging station. But we can use the same approach that we just saw for the simulated robots, which is start from a randomly initialized neural network and then use a learning mechanism to arrive at a desired behavior. Here it's a learned behavior which is uh, docking to the charging station. And here is another one which is approaching at an angle and then realigns. And you can, as you can see that this learned behavior is quite different than the hand engineered one. This one is more animal-like and also uh, faster. So that's the situation. Now we can do that, all that. So for an exercise, let's take uh, another task. Maybe before that, we can also look at, is there any pressing questions? Uh, let, me, let me carry on a little bit and then we can come back. So let's take at this task, it's a Roomba pool task, it's just a name I gave to a fictitious task. Here, imagine you have a, a pool table on top of which there is uh, a Roomba that can move around and it has an onboard computer and a camera attached to it. And the goal is for the Roomba to push these billiard balls to their associated pockets. They cannot go to any pocket that the Roomba chooses. It needs to be uh, associated with the particular pocket and that will be determined by the barcode that are on them. So then the robot, the Roomba has to uh, get closer to a ball, recognize the barcode and from that it will know from which pocket uh, to which pocket it, it, uh, it should push the ball toward and then accomplish the task. And now note that it's, it's not really that easy because the barcode might not be seen uh, from the position from, from where the uh, Roomba is looking at the ball. Rather, it might need to get closer to the ball and position itself correctly. Even then, the barcode might be occluded. It might be facing downward. Then it needs to move the ball around to reveal the barcode. And if it moves the ball too fast, it may end up uh, getting inside the wrong pocket. So it has to be done in a sophisticated way but also as fast as possible. So let's look at a sub goal from here, which is we're not gonna push the ball to a particular pocket. We'll just recognize the barcode. So that's the first goal. Then we'll have to go through the exercise again. Uh, how would we design the task? So first we'll, we can see this again as an episodic task where the robot is attempting at uh, recognizing the barcode every time. So one important thing to note is that the agent, as I mentioned before, is the computational decision-making process, not the physical device. It's better not to think of the Roomba as the agent, which is uh, quite easy to confuse. And, and we often say that the Roomba is doing this or that. But the agent is the computational process. And from that perspective, we may very well see the physical device for the Roomba itself as part of the environment. And then the task has uh, many independent trials. Each trial is about recognizing a barcode as soon as possible, but there's also a timeout. Uh, so an episode ends when there's a scan or after 10 seconds. Now, within an episode, there are multiple time steps. So each time step, it contains uh, an observation observe act cycle that is executed repeatedly and each cycle is of fixed time of 40 milliseconds 
So that's something we have to choose. Say as a designer, that's what we chose. And then the reward signal can be minus one every cycle or time step. And the objective would be to uh, maximize the accumulated episodic reward, which is also known as the return. So does it make sense to think about it? Uh, if we maximize the return, it is also the same as for the Roomba to be able to recognize a barcode as soon as possible, right? So if you, uh, if the Roomba ends up recognizing a barcode in 10 time steps, then the return will be minus 10, which is higher than uh, minus 100, uh, a return that you'll get if you uh, recognize the barcode in 100 time steps. So here is another question, say for a timed out, episode that uh, we want to know how much return the agent received. How much return would that be? So I'm throwing this as a question to you. Say in a particular episode, the agent was not able to scan. So timeout occurs. What will be the return? So the, it, yeah. Sahir says minus 250. Perfect. How do you calculate? Uh, well, I calculated, that's why it seems right. <laughs> but let's do it. Like the, the, the whole episode, if it times out, it will be 10 seconds long. Each time is to be 40 milliseconds, right? So you can just divide 10 by 0 0.04. You're going to get 250. So it will be 250 time steps long. Each time step, you're going to get a reward of minus one. So the total return will be an accumulation of that, which will be minus 250, perfect. So for an action, we are gonna take uh, the uh, wheel velocities. So each wheel, they can be actuated uh, and the motor command of velocity can be sent. The range is actually between minus 500 and plus 500, but we, restricted it between minus 150 and 150 millimeter per second uh, for a reason that I'll describe later. And then the, this action will be exerted once every 40 millisecond. And uh, the robot controller will receive this command and it will keep executing that action until it receives a new action. The robot controller also streams a sensory packet once every 15 millisecond. They say images, they arrive once every 30 millisecond. Then how are we gonna uh, build the observation vector? We can uh, look at the sensory packet. Uh, the Roomba, it has distance, the infrared distance sensors around its body to know where the obstacle is or something that it can be a, a physical object. There are six of them. We can get the values from those six distance signals, but it also has uh, bumping signals two in the front. So we can get values from those and also the kind of velocities. And then the images from the camera, those all together will build the observation vector. So the action, now the question is how that will be uh, drawn. It can be, as it's a, it's a, a, a continuous uh, variable between minus 50 and plus 50, you can draw it uh, based on a normal distribution, which has a particular mean and variance, but then we'll get only one velocity. We can do the same for the other wheel, then we get another action. And together we get a, an action vector that can be seen as drawn from based on a, a multi-dimensional normal distribution. But it can be between minus infinite and plus infinite. So we can clip it between minus one and plus one, and then a scale between minus 150 and plus 150 before sending to the robot controller. Then the learning problem becomes uh, learning these parameters of the distribution, the mean and the variance, because based on that, the action is being drawn. And we can represent these parameters as a map from the observation where the image is passed through a convolutional neural network and concatenated with the uh, value that we get from the road stream. And then it, it's passed through multiple layers of a dense neural network. And then in the end, we get the uh, distribution parameters. 
and a learning mechanism such as stochastic gradient descent we can use to learn the parameters of this neural network and uh, it, when it works it should end up finding uh, the right mean and standard deviation that will provide the optimal action given the context which is the observation now i'm going to skip uh, the details of the mechanism but it's uh, mainly to arrive at an algorithm called uh, reinforce it's a batch version of it consists of two uh, loops that uh, actually represent the the life of an agent where each time step is the uh, iteration that happens inside the inner loop where the agent observes an observation vector completes the forward pass to draw an action and sends it to the robot waits for a while and then after that receives a reward and that iteration total will be 40 milliseconds long and after each episode it computes all the returns and after big k episodes it computes a loss function uh, sample loss and based on which it makes a stochastic gradient descent update now that's a, a valid uh, algorithm for improving uh, the behavior of a reinforcement learning agent uh, the modern deep RL methods they are much more sophisticated than that and much more complicated than, than that but at the core they look pretty much like this uh, with a loss function and uh, perhaps an SGD update so and using so an example would be an algorithm called PPO proximal pulse C optimization uh, such an algorithm can solve many uh, complex tasks within a few million samples these three we have seen before they are actually uh, these uh, clips are generated by training the agents using ppo as well as uh, for the roomba talking to the charging station so that's possible now the problem is if we want to use it for the real world also optimization methods they also typically starts with this kind of behavior which is at the beginning they wiggle randomly do not generate goal-oriented behavior and as it wiggles so randomly that's also the reason we needed to uh, confine the range of actions between one, minus 150 and plus 150 because if we allow the full range there will be more wear and tear and uh, overheating of the motors so that's the problem and that is a big problem for reinforcement learning agents to be applied to real world robots in some cases they may still learn in some cases uh, they may generate unsafe behavior and, and even if they are safe within a confinement there might still be the problem of like taking too long can we wait actually uh, long enough so that the learning can happen in the real world so that is often addressed using the idea of pre-training a policy and two popular approaches one is where a human expert provides demonstrations which are then used to learn the uh, the initial policy right so this is not done using uh, often the exact interface that we have shown sometimes it, it has to be uh, violated uh, by other by different means such as providing the samples directly that are not coming from the environment inside the agent but that's a, a good approach to avoid this kind of initial exploration another approach is where human experts they develop uh, a simulator a realistic simulator and learning and the initial exploration everything happens mostly within the simulator and when the simulation is done then the policy is transferred to the real robot so this is simulation and after learning happens this is a real robot and it's uh, behaving according to a transfer policy policy that is learned completely in simulation so that's also another popular approach for pre-training that avoids all these time consuming and potentially unsafe behavior initial exploration so this approach is known as uh, sim to real now these are great these are what we need in the cases where we cannot wait long enough or we cannot uh, have a behavior that can be potentially unsafe. Now, 
even then we need robots after we pre-train using one of these methods we need robots to continue to learn over time right so think of a, an application where uh, the, we, we are uh, deploying robots at a massive scale that might be like billions of units if each of them starts to fail and require humans experts to provide the demo, new demonstrations or a new simulator until it knows how to come uh, out of that uh, situation or a failure mode, then it, it, there will be billions of robots asking for human help. That kind of scale. So we still need the robots to learn from its failure rather than ask for human interventions. Now, uh, and in some cases, it is actually possible. So here is an example, again, of this initial behavior. But if we let the robot uh, continue to learn, it may learn many different skills before it learns how to solve the harder problem, which is talking to the charging station. For example, first it can learn how to just move forward, which is a useful skill to learn which will be useful uh, to solve the problem of docking to the charging station. But when it learns how to move forward, it can be used to solve another intermediate problem, which is to align with the docking station from arbitrary positions, but not dock yet. It does not dock yet, just aligns. But it is already a, a substantial improvement toward the problem of docking to the charging station. But in the end, it can use all these skills to learn to dock from arbitrary positions. And here, as you can see, it now docks properly. And if you notice, it is actually starting from a very awkward starting position. Unlike the previous uh, clip that we showed where it was mostly starting from the same region where it is mostly looking toward the docking station. Here it is near the uh, charging station and looking away is one of the hardest the positions to start with. But when you learn different skills and utilize them to solve the harder problem, it learns to solve that problem actually more robustly. So this is an ongoing experiment of one of my students, Muhammad Al Said. Now, this is to say that it might be possible because if you think about it, I said that PPO takes like few million tasks to solve the moderately complex task. And if you are running Roomba at 40 millisecond cycle time, it would take about, um, in a week, you're gonna get more than 5 million time steps, which might be just enough to solve a problem like this. Now the question remains, I'm gonna wrap up soon. Now the question remains, in what cases we can already have these kind of applications of continually learning RL systems? Are they possible right now? I just showed an example why it's possible right now to learn how to talk to the charging station. But how do we think about these applications? And in what case is possible, in what case it might not be possible right now? So here I have put different AI applications in a space that is defined by two dimensions, the expected cost of exploration and the level of human interactions. Now, both, if they're high, can be problematic for continual continually learning our agents. Uh, here, there are many different applications such as space robots, which might not have much human interactions, but uh, the exploration cost might be a lot. And for AI governments, it might be both that are massive. In some cases, such as device power management systems or some I have robots such as the one that we saw, the sort robot for, from Kindred, uh, we might be able to scale down uh, the level of human interactions and the, the cost of exploration, at least uh, during the initial deployment through uh, engineering uh, practices such as a canary release or rollouts, and then slowly scale it up. If that is possible in your application, then we can have continued learning our system right now. On the other hand, cases such as uh, AI-based governance, if it turns out to be the case that such uh, governance can impact uh, the whole mass population 
and the exploration can can also if there is a mistake it can be quite costly we should be quite uh, cautious about this kind of applications because right away we cannot start using continuous learning our systems so i hope uh, this might help us uh, determine determine uh, whether a particular application is uh, suitable for continuous learning our systems now this is the penultimate slide some advice now one advice for the for those who are from the industry and but thinking whether it's applicable, think about whether the performance of your product or, or the set of future products could scale well with data. Then you utilize real world exploration whenever it's safe to do so. How to do that? Aim for a deployment strategy where human interaction and exploration cost can be scaled down. And those who are thinking of joining academia or starting a, a PhD, for those, I want to point out the fact that a robot that runs for five years in the real world, such as in your lab, could learn a lot. If you need numbers in five years with 40 millisecond time steps, a robot can gather more than a billion samples. That is enough to be able to solve about 100 tasks that are as complex as, complex as say, the docking problem. And incidentally, five years is also uh, the same, about the same amount of time that takes to uh, finish a PhD. So if you are planning to do a PhD in robot learning, consider running that grand experiment. Let the robot run for the whole time and learn. Let the robot learn over time more and more, how to solve more and more complex tasks. Then one good objective uh, for the PhD program can be to discover the mechanisms that are essential for the robot to learn more and more complex tasks automatically instead of us taking care of providing the task as uh, also uh, was one of the comments from q a that how can we have automatically generated uh, goals so if we can discover such a mechanism that can uh, divide the the final or the most primary goal in an automatic way and generate sub goals and, and let the uh, robot learn from experience more and more complex skills and knowledge. So that would be uh, a great step. Now we spoke about automation and arrived at RL. So it's reasonable to wonder how does the far end of AI and automation look like? So it seems like we will end up developing animal-like machines like we already have in software. Uh, but I'm here, I'm talking about like physical robots. They may behave like animals and learn like animals and live with us. Now, in parallel, I believe we'll also more and more figure out that animals and conscious beings, their desire to be autonomous and free. And when we put these two together, then we can easily uh, deduce that subjugating and controlling intelligent beings, they are questionable. Not only that, they're also not practical and not scalable. Right? So controlling another being, that's kind of like micromanaging, lots of effort from another person. It's not practical, also not uh, moral. And the great thing is, I believe there can be a viable economy full of free AIs, just like right now we have a viable economy full of free humans. There is already, already an example and evidence that it is possible to have a viable economy full of free agents. So why can't we have free AIs as well? And then the far end might look like this, a universe full of many, many AIs, trillions of them roaming around the universe, with overlapping goals and empathy. And uh, it would be great to live with them, uh, not to think of them as replacement, but the, probably the best way to think of them is as our natural progression and true air. All right, thank you.
Thank you, Rupam. Um, I think we may have like five minutes left. So perhaps if you'd like to pick one uh, question among the 15 open questions yeah. in the Q&A session, I think uh, uh, the participants were really active. Uh, 15 open, 18 answered. That's, that's really great. I, I really need to congratulate everyone for asking so many questions. It, it's fun for everyone. That's great. Yeah, I, I was enjoying uh, answering those questions, but then I realized that okay, I have to move on. I wish I could read all of them. Um, we do have the breakout session with you, Rupam, coming up also. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we could use that as well. Okay, how about Chaudhary, what are your views on explainable AI? Could you please suggest some interpretable or explainable RL methods? Me, I would suggest you to look up the literature. I don't work on it. It's a very important um, area uh, because as we ha will have more and more applications, we need uh, our methods to be explainable, inter interpretable, and and uh, I. In addition to that, I also uh, need to see uh, a level of. Uh, caution among, among us that is like to what extent we're expecting them to be explainable. And again, I'll, I'll seek analogy from animals to what extent they are explainable. That might be a good way to think about like, what is the right level of explainability we uh, need to seek from uh, AI. Okay. Can I perhaps ask a uh, three minutes question and then we conclude? Can I yeah. uh, say that basically, if I understand your proposal correctly, I think you're trying to say that um, the way to go to improve sample efficiency in RL is through continued learning, which has to do, I guess, with compositionality and the reuse of skills. Can we say that this is the main uh, hope, you think? That's right. So. In a way, uh, I would agree with those who would say that, well, sample efficiency, uh, obviously we need to look at like simulations or demonstrations. Like uh, when we learn from those, uh, it becomes, it will use much less number of samples from the real world. But I'm looking at a situation which is inevitable, which is that a robot in the end will encounter a new situation and the question of sample efficiency will still be there but we will not have the, uh, the option of intervening by providing demonstrations or simulations. Now we will have to improve our learning mechanisms that are being used uh, to learn by the agent in real time. So compositionality is important, uh, acquisition of skills and knowledge and utilizing them, that's important, which might uh, be done uh, using model-based RL and, and uh, background planning. So those are the methods we have to rely so, but the, the process, which is, uh, so one, one theme here was to not give up on real world learning because it will become in inevitable. So we have to work hard on, on, on increasing the sample efficiency of our, our learning mechanism that will be used in the end. Good. Can I just um, follow up on, yes. from my outsider's perspective on, on continued learning, um, so, uh, so, you know, and I got to say, Rupam and I have been kind of growing in the same environment, uh, the kind of this, this sort of RL. So whenever we talk about continued learning, uh, I think I see it the way that Rupam has been describing it. But there are people working on continued learning as well in the, the deep learning setting. And I think uh, for them, uh, continued learning uh, is a lot synonymous with uh, catastrophic forgetting. Do you see any of these uh, tools and, and advances in that kind of continued learning being useful for what we're trying to achieve in RL? Absolutely. So when we utilize, when I uh, spoke about utilizing uh, already acquired behavior, skills, knowledge, then the problem of catastrophic interference appears. Right? So, so if we use the, the mechanism that I mentioned, stochastic gradient descent, in the most uh, uh, natural way, it turns out that they are not uh, best at uh, utilizing uh, what is already learned. So that that is actually uh, one of the main problems to to continue uh, uh, our research on on this kind of lifelong lifelong learning agents so this is one of the main problems we must address what they are doing uh, should be done 
and should be part of our ultimate set of learning mechanisms. Thank you, Rupam. So uh, on this, we're going to conclude. I think Nadine will copy paste uh, the questions that were left unanswered in the Q&A and she's going to post them in Slack. And so Rupam, if you have a bit more time and you can have a look at the remaining questions on Slack, that would be uh, really appreciated. And as be perfect, yeah. Nadine was mentioning, I think there'll be uh, more uh, opportunities for people to interact with you through uh, breakout sessions and other uh, events. So thank you so much. And uh, we uh, see each other, everyone, in a few minutes for the next talk by uh, Chelsea Finn. Thank you. Okay, thank you, guys.